the Reformed Fellowship. My name is Pastor Rich McLaren, and we are continuing to work our way through the system of theology that is found in Scripture. Uh, as uh, Dr. Sproul organizes that for us and presents it to us in his book, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith. Today we are in chapter 69, where we continue to drill down into this whole uh, concept of our justification. Uh, is it by uh, merit or by grace? Uh, the Reformed position has, and indeed, in my view, the Christian position is that we are justified by grace alone, without human merit, without our merit, uh, either motivated and encouraged by Christ's grace uh, or uh, singularly and on our own. We are saved entirely by grace and not by the merit of our good works. So, of course, this is a conversation that has been ongoing between the Roman Catholic Church and Reformed Protestant uh, ch churches. In the Reformed churches, uh, we uh, recognize that we are fallen in sin and utterly incapable of doing anything to please God. So uh, there is nothing that we can do that can earn or merit everlasting life. All of our best works fall far short of God's perfect standard. And so we emphasize with Scripture that we are saved by grace. If you look at for example, the writings of the Apostle Paul, you find that Paul juxtaposes or puts side by side the notion of our salvation by merit and by works or salvation by grace through faith. And so we are saved either by our own righteousness, that which we do in the flesh, which was the point of view of the Jews of his day and continues to be that of many today, uh, by one's good works, one merits eternal life. And so the Jews taught that by obedience to the law, particularly the law of Moses, observing all of the rituals and all the regulations, uh, keeping true to those commandments, one could merit or earn a place in heaven. One would earn the reward of the blessing, the promise that God gives to his faithful servants. So, uh, the Jewish position did not focus on an imputed righteousness of Christ, which is ours through faith, but rather focused on our earned merit gained by our good works. That is what the, uh, the Jewish uh, church uh, taught in the time of Christ. Now, you, you may remember how that's exposed in the Gospels themselves where Jesus himself confronts uh, the, this uh, aberrant, this heretical Jewish notion that we are saved by our good works. Uh, so, for example, he tells the parable of the uh, publican on the one hand and the Pharisee on the other. The publican or the tax collector is in the temple and he is unwilling to li even lift up his eyes to heaven, but says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Whereas uh, just a short uh, distance away, you have the Pharisee who's, whose prayer is, consists of something like this, I thank you that I'm not like other people, like this uh, tax collector, but I pay tithes of all that I get. And, uh, and so he, he goes through a recitation of his good works, that sets him apart and merits favor before God, as opposed to the tax collector and the sinner, whose wickedness is quite apparent and therefore should not be uh, welcomed or uh, approved. And so the Pharisee uh, took great stock in his ritual observances to the law. And uh, this was all important for the Pharisee. Uh, in another place, in Matthew 23, Jesus confronts the Pharisees with their tremendous hypocrisy. Uh, in one place, he likens them to whitewashed uh, graves. They, they, they have the stone out front that's whitewashed and looks very nice, but underneath, 
They're filled with dead man's bones and all kinds of filthiness and corruption. Uh, that was the depiction that Jesus had of the Pharisees who were the uh, most ardent, most zealous religious reformers and uh, uh, accolades that you could imagine. And yet uh, Jesus' own evaluation of them, those who were at the highest level in Jewish society in terms of religious devotion and performance, achievement, they are the ones whom Jesus pronounces woe on multiple times in that chapter. Woe is a sentence of condemnation, of curse. Woe unto you Pharisees and, and Sadducees, hypocrites, Jesus would say. Um, and he went on through a long litany of uh, ways in which uh, they showed their great sin. And so, uh, if someone in the Jewish faith was relying upon their merit, their good works, Jesus' view of that is that it is insufficient. They are still filled with corruption. And so there might be an outward facade of uh, rectitude, of um, uh, religious devotion, but it is belied by what is in the heart, where all manner of corruptions, idolatries, sin reside. And so Jesus uh, highlighted uh, the, the lack of merit on the part of the Pharisees who were strict observers of the law of Moses. And so with that in mind, we come to the Apostle Paul. Paul is of the same mind of Jesus, and he uh, argues that the message of the gospel comes to us and takes away all ground of human boasting. Uh, we have nothing to boast about on our own. Our salvation is entirely by the grace of God and not something that is earned by us or deserved uh, by us. Uh, we are subject to the grace of God for salvation. You can compare uh, Paul's thinking in this way. There are two kinds of uh, mentalities, if you will, at work. There's first the slave mentality which works to earn or merit a reward. Uh, we experience this every day when we go to work for our employer. We go, we put in our hours, we clock in at the time clock, and we're on the clock for eight hours, nine hours, ten hours, however it is. We uh, do what the employer wants us to do so that at the end of the day or at the end of the week, after the pay period is up, we then get a check which we have earned by our work by our obedience to the uh, employer as we do what he wants us to do. Sell a uh, product, uh, uh, provide a service, what have you. And so we earn the paycheck at the end of the week. Uh, that's a, a slave mentality in effect where you are working to earn favor and you gain it at the end uh, of the week. Uh, this is not the mentality of the children of God. Rather than a slave mentality, we have a sonship mentality. We are the sons of God by grace. We are adopted into the family of God by being united to Christ. And so then, as members of the family of God, we do not need to earn or merit what God provides for us. We are the children of God. And just as in our families... We don't require our children to work to earn their uh, food or their place in our home or the clothing that we give them or the transportation, education, all the rest of it. No, they receive that because they are our children and we take care of them. So they are not there to earn and merit favor. They already have favor because their relationship is not that of a slave to a master but a child, a son or daughter, to a parent, a father or mother. And so we have these two mentalities at work in world history at this time. The slave mentality, which earns and merits something from God. The problem with that, however, is, of course, that we cannot earn or merit anything from God by attempting to live a good life. We always fall short of God's perfection. And so any reliance whatsoever, even the smallest amount, 
on our good works to merit a place in heaven will disappoint us and will have tragic consequences, even hell itself. Paul tells us that we are saved by grace through faith. We have no place for boasting in the gospel of Christ, or no, no place of boasting in our own good works in order to be saved. And so um, this is the uh, two kinds of systems of thought that are at work in the world today. Now, to bring this into the, the orbit of the, the conversation between Roman Catholics and the Reformed, the, the Roman Catholic, as uh, Dr. Sproul points out, ha has three uh, different forms of merit that uh, we can earn before God. One is a condign merit, whereby uh, there is an obligation on God's part to reward us for that which we do. Uh, and so it, 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 it's incumbent upon God. He is a debtor to us when we have done his will and, uh, and met his, his uh, expectations. Then God is obligated by the nature of the relationship to grant to us some uh, merit or reward uh, on the basis of our merit. That's condign merit. There's also congruous merit or congruous merit whereby it is congruent with the purposes of God to give us some reward, some blessing in view of the life that we live. And so there's a measure of uh, merit given to us or reward given to us uh, as a result particularly uh, of uh, our, our penitence and these kinds of things. So condign merit, congruous merit, then uh, thirdly, uh, which kind of takes the cake, if you will, is supererogatory merit. That is merit that goes above and beyond the call of duty. Merit that goes beyond what God expects the individual to do that is so great and so meritorious that it not only earns life for the, the individual who performs it, but also is uh, of sufficient value that it can benefit others as well. So this is a work that goes above and beyond the call of duty and uh, it may be uh, gathered, if you will, in, in a repository which the Roman Catholic Church describes as the treasury of merit. And it is out of this treasury of merit that indulgences may be made before God and those who are in purgatory who need to perhaps uh, be purged of their sins and perhaps be released from their uh, debts there, uh, the supererogatory works of the saints can be applied to them through the purchase of indulgences, and these can uh, release uh, the uh, souls of those who are yet in purgatory. You remember this was the big deal in the uh, time of the Reformation where um, I think it was Johannes Eck, uh, was going through Germany and saying something like, as soon as the, the coin tinkles in, in the uh, box, the soul springs free from purgatory. And so people would come and make their contributions, purchase these indulgences, and these indulgences would somehow, by the uh, application of the priest or the, the church, uh, set free uh, those relatives and friends who are in purgatory because they make use of the treasury of merit stored up by the saints. How much is that is there? It, it's an elastic concept, isn't it? It's whatever the church needs, that's what we have to offer. As long as you have, now here's my cynicism, as long as you have the money to pay for it, we have the merit stored up for you to make use of, to uh, rescue those who we are holding hostage, if you will, in purgatory. You pay the money and they go free. Now, that, that's a little bit pushing the, the, the boundaries of the language here, but you get the point that in the Roman system, there is merit to be gained by uh, the saint or by the believer. Condign, congruent, or supererogatory merit. And as Dr. Sproul points out, the Reformed Church and Scripture itself uh, takes away any ground of boasting in that which we do. Now, we spoke a, 
a, a couple of weeks ago about the relationship between faith and works. And uh, you have a similar um, uh, argument going back and forth there. Are we saved by faith alone or by faith plus works? And you remember in the Roman position, uh, the, the righteousness of Christ is not only not, not imputed to us, and reckoned ours through faith, but rather it is imparted to us. It uh, is infused into our lives such that uh, the righteousness of Christ works itself out in our lives, in our conduct. Now here is the insidious nature of this teaching on the part of Rome. You have this work of Christ, but you still have your own human uh, responsibility to fulfill uh, God's requirements. You still have to earn merit. Condign, congruent, supererogatory, one of the three, but you've got to earn merit to gain life. And so your, your justification, which in the Roman point of view uh, comes at the conclusion of a lifetime of work and effort, uh, that justification is grounded in the, the, the impartation of the righteousness of Christ and your good works. The problem with that whole system is that it has a weak link. It is your good works. If there is any reliance upon your good works, the whole system collapses. You see, uh, Rome is already admitting that the impartation of the righteousness of Christ is not alone on its own able to save you. You must add to that your own good works, however motivated, stimulated, and, and helped by the Spirit, and so forth. It is your good works that contribute to your justification. Condign merit, congruent merit, supererogatory merit. So they are placing, ultimately, a, a faith in what you achieve. And that is where uh, Rome goes far astray from the gospel of Christ, which uh, says that we have nothing on which to boast. We are saved entirely by grace through faith in Christ. And so uh, the whole uh, message of the gospel is to undermine any confidence in the flesh and to uh, reposit all faith, all confidence, all trust in the work of Jesus Christ for us and in that alone. So, you can have the slave mentality or the sonship mentality. You can depend upon human merit or you can depend upon Christ's merit. It's up to you. But if you depend on human merit, if you have the slave mentality which says you've got to earn your way to heaven, uh, you are going to fail. You will perish. You will go to hell. Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that find it. Uh, there, there are many who deceive themselves into thinking that they have merit before God, but they will uh, only discover that it was a foolish and a false hope. Trust in Christ and in Him alone. Now, the big argument then in, in historical terms, which uh, Sproul con considers, is that between the Roman Church and the Reformed Protestant Church. Uh, there are other aspects of... Uh, the relationship between merit and grace that come into the world today, the Arminian evangelical uh, substitutes merit earned by obedience to the Ten Commandments with merit earned by the exercise of faith, the exercise of one's will. I choose for God and God blesses me then in response, rewards me with salvation. And that is also another form of works righteousness, slave mentality. You change the terms, you change the conditions, you make it simpler. Uh, we can't keep the whole law, and so we'll just uh, reduce it down to the exercise of faith. And that's sufficient to save. Well, this is an improper understanding of faith. Faith itself is not what earns salvation. It's the righteousness of Christ that earns that salvation for us. Faith is merely the instrument that receives this salvation, and faith itself is a gift of God. It is part of the salvation that God gives to us. So the Arminian evangelical also needs to examine his uh, understanding of the merit of one's faith. 
Now, in more contemporary terms, uh, you have the progressive evangelical uh, and certainly the modernist Christian for whom it seems like all categories of reward, uh, of work and reward, of uh, uh, earning things is lost. You, you see that in, uh, you know, everybody's a winner at school, everybody gets a trophy, everybody gets a prize. You don't have to earn or merit. Achievement is uh, leveled out. Everyone's a winner in the modern socialistic uh, egalitarian mindset that we have today. Um, and so the, the old categories, it seems to me, of uh, work and merit uh, are collapsing today into a sense that everyone, just by mere virtue of one's existence, uh, is a winner, it, it receives a reward, merits life. And so everyone is basically good, that's sufficient, and however you understand that, either in the, in, in the mainline Protestant point of view, just your good works improving your life and, and blessing you, and hopefully you have a better life in the world to come, if there is a world to come. Um, you know, th th there's not a real clear sense of the future for the, the mainline Protestant Christian. Uh, in, in the more progressive evangelical um, everything is focused on faith, but there's no sense of uh, obligation before God, accountability before God uh, that requires grace to satisfy us, to take away our sin and to bring us into a right relationship with God. Um, the whole, again, once more, the category of, of works righteousness disappears and it seems to me there's a leveling of things in, in that point of view as well. And, um, not expressing that as well as I would like. But um, it, it just in our progressive mindset, that those categories seem to be uh, diminished or erased. And so we do not fully appreciate, I think, uh, our dependence upon the grace of God, which comes in and satisfies us because we are unworthy. You know, the progressive Christian basically is saying we're, we're basically okay. Uh, think of uh, the Joel Osteens of the world uh, uh, who speak in, in a prosperity gospel sort of way. Um, we need to rely upon the grace of God and on the righteousness of Christ if we are going to be saved. That is, it is only Christ who merits eternal life for us and Him alone. Rest in that. Uh, run to Christ. Cry out to Him to cover you with that righteousness. There's no no other hope. Well, this is Pastor McLaren for the Reformed Fellowship, a ministry of First Presbyterian Church in Perkasie. Uh, if you want to attend a great church, small church, but a great church, come to First Church in Perkasie. We're on the corner of Fifth and Ray Streets, and our services begin with Sunday school at 9:30, and then. The worship services at 11 o'clock. We look forward to seeing you sometime soon. God bless. Take care. Bye.